What's up, everybody? Uh, we're here this week with Scott Keener, uh, who um, developed Graffiti 3D. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the VR art world and um, where that whole space is headed. So um, Scott, why don't you talk a little bit about your background as UX designer and um, sort of just a general intro into how you got involved in this whole VR space. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be talking with you today. Um, I'm more used to listening than speaking, so um, yeah, this will be really interesting. Hopefully, you guys enjoy it. Um, I'm a user experience designer by trade. Um, I went to University of Washington, Seattle uh, for about five years and graduated two years ago. Ever since then, I've been working um, in the healthcare field for a, a company called Harris Corporation. And my primary job there is to design graphics and uh, mock up uh, new concepts for UI components and um, systems that they want to develop. So um, yeah, I'm constantly working with code and with graphics in my uh, daily life. And getting into virtual reality was sort of natural for me because um, uh, a lot of my skills translated directly over to the VR world. Like, um, as soon as I needed to uh, uh, design uh, UI interactions for my application, I, you know, knew uh, what to do. I knew how to bring in users for user testing, and um, yeah, I've been able to handle all the graphics and um, movies and uh, all of the surrounding stuff that goes into supporting an application like this, uh, as well as develop it all myself. Nice. Um, so, and uh, maybe you can, you can go into sort of the inspiration behind Graffiti 3D and how you got, how you found Leap Motion, I guess. Today. Yeah. So, hmm. it, it's tricky to decide how far back to go in this. <laughs> um, but I suppose a good place to start is uh, when I experienced VRcade in Seattle um, back in June of 2014. So um, I've been interested in virtual reality ever since I saw the uh, first Oculus Rift ki Kickstarter. Um, uh, I, I saw it before the Kickstarter was over and um, I, I thought it was sort of a neat device, uh, but I, I didn't uh, really start paying a whole lot of attention to it or seriously consider it as, uh, uh, you know, a blossoming uh, tech uh, trend uh, until I noticed the um, industry leaders that were really excited about it, like John Carmack and um, the head of Valve, um, what's his name, Gabe Newell, uh, were throwing their weight behind it. And um, more and more people uh, were started developing cool applications for it. So I realized that it was going to be uh, a significant thing. And I, I think that like an important thing about this current wave of VR development is that people are really starting to see it outside of the context of gaming. And I feel like I, that's really huge. Like, and that's very unique. Like, it's opposed to like some sort of sci-fi novelty piece of hardware. It's now like, oh, we can use it for training simulation. We can use it to, um, you know, as a rehabilitation device, uh, device for physical therapy, we can use it for all these different things that are not just gaming. And while right. gaming is like this really rich sandbox, game development is this really rich sandbox for user experience designers like yourself to play around. It's sort of just the beginning threshold of possibility. Um, so right. that's kind of actually what I found is interesting about your work is it taps into this like, um, you know, you're not going in with an objective beyond um, it's a, it's very explorative, and I, I guess that's what I was so intrigued by. Yeah, VR is really interesting because it uh, sort of had a, a community and a bunch of people thinking about what it could be applied to uh, for a really long time, and then that sort of died off, and we got this new 
uh, version of VR that's very like gaming oriented right now um, because Oculus sort of took it in that direction because uh, I think they were thinking that uh, the games industry was best suited to handle the process of creating and uh, managing the assets uh, required to do really good VR experiences. But um, people have been thinking about therapeutic applications for VR for you know, over uh, 20 years. And um, it's interesting to like go over some of that old territory and uh, sort of discover new ideas through the research that was done um, in the early days. Totally, yeah. Um, all right, well, why don't you dive into a little bit um, about what what 3D, uh, graffiti 3D is um, and, uh, you know, how it diverts from art tools of the past. And yeah. So uh, most of you guys have probably seen uh, uh, at least an image or a video of someone using graffiti 3D, but from a really high level, it's just a uh, virtual reality uh, application that allows people to uh, deposit 3D material around them in space. So um, uh, it's very similar to uh, sort of the, the feel and, and process of using a spray, spray paint can because you have to arc your whole body and sort of use your arms together rather than uh, just flick your wrist or move a couple of fingers. Uh, precisely to produce strokes. So, um, yeah, I was uh, sort of trying to develop something that uh, could utilize those that muscle memory that graffiti artists had uh, from using things like markers and spray cans, uh, but that enabled this otherwise impossible ability to deposit 3D material in space around them. Um, it's also similar to like uh, light painting, if you guys are familiar with that. Can you explain uh, that a little more? But actually, I don't, I, I don't know if I've heard of that. Yeah, so light painting is when artists set up a, a camera in a static position and then um, do a long exposure of them uh, moving in front of the camera with a, oh, a, yeah. That's awesome. yeah, a little handheld light. And that builds up over time to create this really beautiful, curvy sort of 3D swoop uh, in space. But the problem with that is that you can't actually see what you're doing as you do it. You sort of have to uh, keep in mind uh, or keep in, in memory all of the strokes that you've made so that you can visualize what you've done internally. And then you, you can check the image later to see if it lined up. Um, yeah, you obviously can't experience those from different angles also, unless you set up an array of cameras uh, to capture a bunch of different angles. Actually, I was thinking uh, I'd show a little example of some light painting here. Yeah, totally. It's kind of fascinating to watch. Yeah, the, the muscle memory element to it is different, is uh, interesting you brought up because like so many art schools today, they'll give these assignments. A lot, I have a lot of friends who went to art school and, and they'd be spend like a whole week or several weeks on one painting or one drawing. And it, and it, when in fact, um, you know, an even more powerful way to learn how to draw certain, like the human anatomy or certain geometric shapes is actually just doing it again and again and again and again, that physical task is, um, right. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really interesting concept, and I actually didn't think of how VR could be applied that way for art students. But yeah, right. Yeah, it seems like a lot of um, artistic media like this are very muscle memory based. It takes a while to sort of build up the chops necessary to uh, bring your imagination into real life. Right. And graffiti 3D is no different. Yeah. There's uh, a whole lot of uh, stuff I've learned about um, uh, how to approach 3D drawings in general and uh, just muscle memory that I've developed in the process. Cool. So what else? Oh, yeah, I was going to mention uh, 3D printing pens also because uh, this is a technology that allows people to draw in 3D space around them that recently came out. Um, and actually, I've got some 3D printing pen created stuff right here. This is a 
I don't know if you can see it very well, yeah. a Stussy that I doodled oh, cool. on a piece yeah. of paper. That's and awesome. then I added uh, some scaffolding to it to make it a three-dimensional object. It's sort of a fun little uh, thing to mess around with. But nice. the problem with that is that you have to think about physics while you're drawing. You can't just put the pen to a surface and then draw a diagonal line out in 3D space. Uh, it'll just fall down. So uh, you have to build up scaffolding and think about how you know the static forces are going to sit on what you create. Um, Graffiti 3D lets you bypass the physics and do otherwise completely impossible things like uh, you know create a building worth of material in front of you or uh, have the material change over time. Yeah, so you can scale way faster. Do you have any uh, right. examples of any? I, I see a couple of videos here. Maybe you want to share. Uh, Let's see. Um, under inspiration. Uh, Maybe the well, you, the light painting example. Did you do that one yet? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you guys see that? No, it for some reason it didn't pop up. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think I'll have to like do a screen share. Or oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Call screen share. Okay. Yeah. So this is an example of what it looks like uh, for someone to paint with their light, um, like flashlight. What's really interesting to me about this is how he's got one hand planted on the ground as a reference point, and he just sort of bases everything off of that. Can you guys see that? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so let's see, what else uh, do I want to show you guys? Um, Maybe I'll just hop into Graffiti 3D and actually uh, yeah, that'd be set awesome. up real quick. Cool. Yeah. So this is the current build that anyone can go download from itch.io right now. And it's going to run really laggy on my machine right now because Skype is taking up like 50% of my CPU. But oh well, I think you'll be able to see it. Cool. So this is the uh, blank space that I've created for uh, people using the, the virtual reality version of this. There's also an augmented reality mode that I'll show you in a second. But I intended this just to be sort of like uh, a spatial equivalent of a blank canvas, as sort of neutral as possible uh, while still providing a context for stuff. Yeah, so the Leap is doing some flashy weird thing. I think it has something to do with the CPU usage. Uh, but let me just draw a dinosaur. So as you can see, I'm just putting my hand where I want to deposit material. And then to actually draw, uh, I've coded it to uh, listen to the, the distance from your thumb to your index finger uh, knuckle and get wider the closer you are to that. One thing I've learned about using these tools is that generally it makes more sense to try to fill out the volume that you're uh, going for, that you're trying to represent, than it does to uh, draw a bunch of cross sections. So if I start with a horizontal, I just got a little glitch there. I don't know if we're still connected. Yeah, no, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Skype cool. does take, it's just Skype takes up so much CPU. Right. You'll just have to come in, uh, can't come into the, to the studio, the Twitch studio next time <laughs> live for a better <laughs> stream. Yeah, I'd love to. Where are you guys located, by the way? Um, we're in Soma, San Francisco. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Basically right under the Bay Bridge. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So um, yeah, as you can see, I can just uh, lean in and put stuff exactly where I want it to be. And it just feels like I'm reaching to that spot and um, doing it intuitively. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one of the things that inspired me to make this application. The three hand-eye coordination uh, potential uh, in VR is just amazing. Like every day we're 
using this 3D hand-eye coordination to interact with our environment. But for some reason, uh, uh, the computing technology hasn't been able to uh, sort of utilize that for anything useful up until up until now. And I think it just has to do with like the input and output being too expensive in the past. But now that we actually have these uh, true 3D uh, output devices and true 3D input devices, um, all of these these applications are becoming unlocked. Right. We're just missing haptics. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, you mentioned this in the, in the blog post, and I, I guess, you know, probably not everybody watching um, uh, read those, but uh, what is it specifically about virtual reality that you think uniquely serves this whole mission as opposed to just, you know, uh, exploring this type of, uh, of creation just in 3D space? Like, what do you think actually being in a virtual environment adds to that? Or do you think it, a similar, uh, similar effect can be achieved like in an augmented type application? Uh, I think a similar effect can be achieved with augmented reality too. And that's something I actually just forgot to show off. Uh, there's a button I can press in there that'll uh, turn on the leap motion, pass through cameras, and let me um, uh, see my space as, as I'm sketching stuff. I think the, the killer benefit of the, the Oculus Rift is that it lets you see it, data in 3D. Yeah. Um, just yeah, I, I don't know if I fully buy into the the presence uh, argument right now. This idea that yeah, can you can you dial back and, and sort of because I I've heard that throw, term thrown around a lot. Like people right. people will antagonize the word immersion and they'll say presence. And so I, can you sort of I guess talk about that uh, the the lexicon? Yeah, a bit? yeah. I personally like to shy away from using the term presence when I describe this to people. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, it became popular around the time that Michael uh, Abrash did that talk uh, about a year and a half ago about presence and his first experience with it through a virtual pit test. And since then, people have sort of treated the concept as if it's an objective, like binary line where all we need is like a certain level of uh, Te technical fidelity and a switch will be flipped and we'll feel like we're inhabiting virtual spaces and we're actually in other places but from all of the virtual reality experiences I've had so far I, I'm left skeptical it doesn't seem like uh, like someone can deliver an experience right now that actually feels like real life a true but, departure yeah Right, right. Or, yeah, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to feel like real life, but it actually has to feel like you're in another place, um, uh, inhabiting someone else's shoes, potentially. Uh, yeah, I've, I've played hundreds of DK2 demos, and I bought uh, Elite Dangerous because it's just a really mind-blowingly awesome game. Um, but I've always felt like all of these attempts to like put people inside of virtual characters and make them feel like the virtual body is their body, it, it just comes off as cheesy right yeah. now. Um, yeah, so the technology to actually do that is so far out. I, I think we should be focusing on the benefits that come from natural 3D interaction right now because um, there is so much value that comes from being able to see in 3D and interact in 3D with data that um, it, it doesn't matter, it, it's not uh, a fault for VR. It doesn't perfectly make you feel like you're in another place uh, in someone else's body. Yeah, that's definitely really interesting. I mean, it, and I think that the having the high fidelity 3D input is a really sort of crucial part of the puzzle because, I don't know, I, I feel like it's kind of, it breaks the fourth wall a little bit if you have like this 2D controller and it's like, okay, right. I, you know, I feel like I'm in eighth grade playing Mario Kart. You know what I mean? Like, how does this, right. like, how is this, like, a true departure from, um, like, how, you know, I, I feel like 3D input is, like, what makes it the next gen sort of experience. And I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's different from just 3D monitors or 3D TVs. Yeah. Because it actually fully surrounds you. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, one thing that, like, I, I feel like in terms of haptics, at least, too, what I mentioned before, like, I, I feel like some of our engineers internally and also in our developer community have sort of found ways through creating texture with, like, stuff like WebGL and, um, and sort of almost, uh, uh, I don't know, creating these, doing these, like, uh, I don't know, sort of tricks, tricking your mind into thinking that you're that you're experiencing something um, when you when you reach out and you're actually able to touch it. And I don't know, it's it's, it's a it's interesting to see. It's an interesting territory to be in because you can kind of play around. Um, and so yeah, I yeah. definitely think I don't know, abstract stuff is pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, you let's see, want to move a little bit into inspiration. Or, um, yeah, totally. Okay. Um, I dropped a whole bunch of uh, images in this Google Doc um, that have just inspired me over the last year or so, and a couple of things I've created in Graffiti 3D. So let's go through some of these. Um, I included this image because I saw it like uh, seven or eight years ago um, when I was like first learning about 3D graffiti and like wanting to create it. Um, this just uh, pops out of the page in a really intense way. And um, they had to go through all of these lengths to manually shade it so that it, it looks 3D. I just thought, how cool would it be if someone could uh, use their, their freehand art skills to just sketch this up in 3D space and then export the mesh and you know take an image from any angle that they want. Um, yeah, this just got me into 3D graffiti in general. And then um, I... Uh, can you share yeah, that okay. image? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, uh, okay. I thought I was presenting. There we okay. go. Yeah, there it is. Cool. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, this one is uh, really beautiful just because of how much attention to detail and uh, little effects they included in it. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so I've got a bunch of light paintings up here because um, before I got started on this project, I saw this image mm -hmm. and uh, I got really excited because I just thought, how awesome would it be if you could inhabit that space with those sparks? Yeah. You could walk down uh, the tube and just experience the, the glow of that, that creation uh, would be really mind-boggling and you know awe-inspiring. So um, that got me thinking about uh, light art in general. And, and is this using that photography um, effect that you were talking about earlier? That exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what, they just can you remind me of what that's called again? Um, I, I think of it as just light drawing. Okay. But there's probably some formal name for it. And there's there's a whole bunch of other ones here too. So this is uh, a static light drawing um, that someone did. Not really sure what the origins of it are. And uh, here, just some floating rings uh, sitting on a dock. Um, but images like this, uh, actually out in the world, um, got me really excited about the idea of, of bringing graffiti 3D out in the into the world and. Uh, like enabling people to do stuff like this with uh, GPS devices and um, 3D markers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on uh, getting this on a mobile headset right now so that it can be uh, freed from the cables and um, used for some of these cool augmented reality um, like geolocation tide uh, artworks. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, that, that, this is really awesome. It's very beautiful. Um, cool. Yeah, so this is uh, supposedly the largest light painting in the world. Um, we watched that video earlier of the guy drawing the um, spider mm -hmm. in it, uh, and that's the same spider. Well, so this is next level haunted house happening. That's crazy. Right, <laughs> yeah. Apparently this was all one like stroke or one continuous um, really uh, uh, capture on the camera. Wow. So 
Um, I think he was probably there for a while doing that. Yeah. And then some graffiti images that have been really inspiring for me. Yeah, I showed that first one, but I'll just quickly cycle through these Odeif pieces because they're just awesome. Um, and how did, you, how did you um, stumble upon this artist? Because you, you mentioned this a lot in your blog, this guy at the beginning of your blog post, I believe, right? Right, yeah. Uh, this image is in the blog post. Yeah. He's just one of the various graffiti artists that I've come into contact, or, you know, I haven't contacted him, but I've uh, come into contact with his work and just really liked it for a long time. So I saved his name. Uh, on a text file and uh, yeah, looked it up later. Oh, someone, wait, which, um, someone from the chat, I guess, is asking um, how large uh, the drawing is? The yeah, if you drawing. see the guy, oh, the first drawing. So this is a warehouse. Oh, wait, uh, are you talking about the one we were just showing? Um, or this one? I'm not sure, I'm getting clarification right now. For some reason, yeah. the chat is working on my computer. Okay. Yeah, this is just a black book uh, drawing, so it's probably the size of a regular sheet of paper. Yeah. But um, this is a full warehouse, and uh, it's hard to see because it's so dark and these walls look really weird, but um, that's the far side of this hangar that this guy's in, and I think we can get a better uh, sense of the scale by looking at this video. Yeah, it looks like yeah, it's just populating space. a warehouse. That's really awesome. Yeah. OK, so um, yeah, there's this other graffiti artist that I've always been uh, just really uh, awestruck by. Um, Dame is a, a well-known uh, 3D artist that does these really crazy uh, vector-based uh, pieces on flat surfaces. Let's see, I thought I had another one in here, but I think this is also by that guy. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, stuff like this is, I think it's just gorgeous. Right. There's something about it that just pops. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. So I think that's the only Dame image I uploaded. This is PETA. Anyway, uh, so uh, these images have just been inspiring me and making me think in different directions with this application. Um, I thought this one was kind of neat because um, we can actually uh, reproduce this with Graffiti 3D right now. And um, yeah, I was thinking it might be fun to draw in augmented reality for a second. Uh, yeah, do it. Do yeah, totally. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about like because you know I know that that your vision involves sort of like the geo um, location element, and I, I guess I'm that's a really intriguing unex and slash unexpected sort of mechanic to this application. So I'd love to hear more about that as you're as you're demoing. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to grab an apple real quick because okay. <laughs> see how close I can get it to this. going to be kind of weird because you guys will see what my webcam sees and then you'll see what's coming through the leap motion so you'll have a pretty comprehensive view of my house here <laughs> oh and you use the hovercast menu harkening oh, back yeah. to last week <laughs> right so, uh, Hovercast is awesome. Yeah, it, Zach does really uh, amazing work. Yeah, he does. If you're and out there, works, Zach. <laughs> he works really fast, too. It's yeah. like amazing how many updates uh, he's made to Hovercast since I integrated it. 
All right, so here's the augmented reality pass-through mode. And I think this, this is a lot more entertaining than just the pure virtual reality mode because um, uh, it, things seem like they just float in space wherever yeah. you are. Let's, let's change this to white, actually. Seems to be a little bit of a lag, but so I'm sorry okay. out there for, but it's just the CPU is uh, a little bit hectic. Can you hear so us? So I don't have any transparent shaders right now, okay. unfortunately, but uh, yeah, this kind of works. It's a little floaty um, because I think there's something weird about the way the pass-through image aligns with uh, world space in Unity, but it's really close and it feels like good enough to actually uh, give the perception of it hovering over that happle. How long have you been developing in Unity? What, um, like, what drew you to that engine um, in the first place? Yeah, actually, uh, only as long as I've been working on this game. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, lear the learning curve, it seems to be pretty, like, it seems like people can kind of pick it up and run with it pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, it was really fast. I had experience with Unreal Engine uh, before that, and, um, yeah, picking up C Sharp was probably the hardest part. Mm -hmm. um, I had never coded in C Sharp before this project, and um, uh, it, it wasn't too difficult to pick up either because. You cut out there for a second. Can you oh, hear me? What was the last thing you heard? Uh, it wasn't too difficult to pick oh, up yeah. because. Oh, Unity. Uh, oh, I mean uh, C sharp. Yeah, it, it's so similar to other languages. Um, it's got a couple little quirks, but um, it, it felt like the syntax was almost exactly the same as uh, you know C C plus plus. Right. Yeah, uh, it was pretty straightforward. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, prototyping? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Do you want to hear about uh, my ideas related to how this can can help people prototype, or do you want to hear about my prototyping process? Um, both, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so my prototyping process started on paper, um, months and months before I actually sat down with uh, any programming languages to make anything. Uh, I sketched out this like high level document describing what I was looking for. I don't know if you can see it very well, but I've got these sketches of uh, someone wearing a mobile headset uh, drawing a line for a QR you code. You should full or, screen your um, chat window again. Okay. So that we can see you better. Let's see. I think I just need to turn off uh, screen sharing. There you go. Cool. Yeah, so, paper prototyping is the best. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely getting ideas down early and testing them with the real world as soon as possible Yeah, uh, seems to be uh, the way to do it. Totally. Yeah, testing early and often was like the, the like constant refrain from all of our like all of our most successful 3D jam participants, uh, a couple of which I think are watching, so are, are watching, but uh, yeah, definitely that's the key, just getting it in front of like real people, right, and real. Right. Yeah, so uh, I actually um, bought a PlayStation Move uh, system. I got a PlayStation I and two PlayStation Moves because I really thought it was going to be the, the cheapest way to achieve what I was looking for. So I had people like use the PlayStation Move markers in real life and try to like imagine uh, the buttons doing things. And that was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I learned that it's good to have all of the uh, central functionality uh, like located on the controller if possible. So like pressing um, buttons on the controller is a preferable way to select things um, versus like uh, trying to imagine a menu in space or um, separating the controls. 
right. uh, so that one hand does certain things and the other hand does other things. Um, and that was a philosophy I sort of uh, brought uh, through to the uh, leap motion version of this. Um, when I was thinking, how could I translate this into uh, a hand tracker uh, input um, rather than a, a controller input, um, I just tried to think of the simplest way to map each button on the controller to actions of the hands. Mm -hmm. um, so initially I had a control hand with all of the, the settings and then a drawing hand that allowed people to deposit material and um, it seemed to work okay but my main problem was uh, each of the actions, each of the main settings was controlled by a movement of the finger uh, on their left hand so either um, pinching the left thumb in uh, would increment the color or the user would uh, bring their index finger in on their left hand to change the size uh, and also uh, if they wanted to change the shape of the brush head then they could so, uh, it, was, so it was like palette uh, palette and drawing hand type of setup yeah yeah okay. um, similar to the hovercast <clears throat> setup right. I have now uh, the difference was just that uh, each uh, setting change was mapped to a discrete movement of one of the fingers mm -hmm. and also users had to specify a sequence of colors and sizes and shapes. So, uh, did, you, so did you find that that was just sort of uh, too many options or? Well it, it was weird for people to, yeah. to even do uh, the action with their left hand like trying to describe to people uh, okay, to change the size, you have to take your index finger of your left hand and then bend that in toward your palm. Like, it, it just required way too much explanation. Did you, did you test with people of, like, of both handedness? Or did yeah. you see a difference between the two, I guess? Um, no, I, I didn't notice yeah. any uh, difference between um, people using it in left handed mode versus right handed Ooh. mode. Um, initially, I actually release the application without a left-handed mode because um, uh, when I started developing it I thought the Leap Motion 3D Jam uh, cutoff had ended oh. so I yeah I wasn't even making it for the 3D Jam I was just doing it for fun for myself and uh, like three days before the 3D Jam uh, ended I got a minimum like viable prototype of this and um, Ended up submitting that uh, without any other features like, like left-handed mode or yeah. uh, the box that specifies the, um, uh, the leap motion sort of like high confidence zone. Uh, that was also not part of it. Um, also, the indicators in the hand weren't there mm -hmm. when I initially released it. So it was super rough. Yeah. Um, and I've changed it a lot as a result of feedback that I've gotten from people. Yeah, that's interesting. We have like a very disproportionate number of, of left-handed people in the office. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. There's like, um, supposedly it's like, I don't know, 10 and 100, and we have more than, a lot more than that. But um, anyways, we have a couple of questions from in the chat room. One is, hey, Scott, have you experimented with scale at all, like drawing a tunnel and then scaling yourself down? Um, yeah. Uh, slash it up so you can walk through it. That's from Martin, who um, was one of our 3D jammers. Yeah. Um, I haven't actually implemented anything in my application that allows people to scale themselves or meshes yet because um, that interaction is kind of complicated to imagine. Like, um, it's not clear what should map to scaling up and um, the actual. Uh, way I would accomplish that is still up in the air. Yeah. Uh, however, um, I've thought a lot about this and I think it would be really useful to um, include that option. I'm, I'm leaning toward scaling the user rather than scaling their mesh at this point because the way I've treated Graffiti 3D from the beginning was uh, more of like a, a static creation space where you move in the space rather than the piece move around you. Um, I might go back on that as I experiment with it and see 
what's more usable. Now I'm just thinking of all these like genre bending experience, VR experiences that you could do play just just playing the scale alone is like the core mechanic. It's like oh, the yeah. possibilities are so endless there. Yeah, yeah. I've wanted to see a um, VR version of Powers of Ten for a while. Oh which yeah. Is a classic movie. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, shows people zooming out uh, to like you know hundreds of thousands of times the um, scale that we we normally see and then zooming in really 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 small oh and then um one more question zach said along the same lines like have you considered um uh, a mechanic where you're you can save drawing sections like a tree for instance and then duplicating have you oh, ability yeah. to duplicate them in the scene yeah yeah i love that idea i've been thinking it could be really useful to have the ability to sort of paint by mesh like mm -hmm. just select some some mesh and be able to drag uh out, out a whole bunch of them or uh, just drag out one uh that's stretched uh for the whole stroke um yeah i was thinking uh painting leaves on on flowers uh could be a good application of something like that or if um uh the mesh comes out in in chunks like mm -hmm. if, if i have it uh just deposit mesh after mesh of whatever uh, thing the user selected then it can be useful for map creation like uh the track mania or halo reach editor where you you drag out um uh, roads that people walk on or um terrain it, it could be um uh really intuitive for people to just build spaces uh, for uh, ex exporting as maps. Yeah, and you mentioned here um, in your notes like uh, sort of the elements of Unity 5 that you're looking forward to incorporating and it seems like there's a lot of um, potential. It seems like, I, I don't yeah. know like the full um, sort of suite of new things that are within the, the release, but it seems like a lot of um, work creative tools and chat and shading enhancers and stuff like that. Can you speak a little bit like how how you plan to maybe um, upgrade the application incorporating Unity 5 stuff? Yeah, so for me, um, the most exciting changes that come with Unity 5 are the things that are free in the free version now that before required, you know, over a thousand dollars to access. Right. Things like dynamic uh, lighting that cast shadows um, were just impossible in my application in Unity Free, um, and now I, I don't need a subscription for it. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Also, I'm super excited about uh, physically based shaders because uh, it seems like there's a lot of potential to make people's creations feel a lot more tangible um, and just yeah, a lot more there uh, based on the material that they're made out of and um, how they're lit. And I really think it would be um, a lot of fun to paint with uh, physical materials that uh, look a lot like real life materials, like uh, rusty metal and um, wood grain that has a little bit of um, uh, normal mapping to it. And uh, I'm working on allowing people to paint like bricks right now using um, procedural materials. Uh, so yeah, procedural materials are also a really exciting thing um, uh, that I'm starting to explore because uh, you can get so much variation uh, on the fly with them uh, with such a small amount of work on the, the shader and material side. Um, it yeah. looks like you have a link here for 18 free substances. That'd be a good resource to share. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the chat room. That's the one I just recently started. I don't know why my chat's not working very well. Hopefully you guys get that. Um, so I, I wanted to show you guys actually the newest build that I've been working on, because it actually has dynamic shadows implemented and a couple of different materials. Although I think this is going to lag out even harder than the last one. OK, so, well. Everybody just bear with us knowing that CPU is being very not in our favor <laughs> right now. I just fixed a bunch of issues with the mesh normals that I had before too. So um, even the basic 
uh, tune shader is looking a lot nicer now. Also, I'm drawing with my mouse instead of leap motion because. Oh, uh, can you share your screen? We're just seeing your chat. Oh, sorry, sorry. And also, we had a question uh, from the audience. Uh, what do you? What are your opinions on the Microsoft Hololens? Oh yeah, the Hololens seems really, really cool. I definitely want to give it a shot as soon as I can, and. I'd, I'd consider buying one for myself, depending on uh, what the specs are when it actually comes out. Um, yeah, it seems like a really great device. I'm a little bit uh, concerned with the view, because a lot of people were saying uh, it's just like right in the center of your vision, but it, it's so new, um, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have, it's the next, Three to five years are going to be really interesting in, in terms of the types of hardware that get released, and uh, I don't know, just sort of like gradually easing in the social normativity of, of these types of wearable devices. It's interesting. Right. Yeah, you bring up a um, an interesting subject. People uh, are sort of against uh, wearables right now a little bit. It, like Google Glass seems popular. Oh yeah, though we there was definitely a whole movement in Sar an anti uh, wearables uh, movement in San Francisco, in, in terms of a lot of the uh, the local bars and restaurants and lots of signage. So it's a very right. interesting cultural debate happening. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm not advocating for uh, wearing a, a virtual reality or augmented reality device all the time uh, when you're like. Uh, outside, walking down the sidewalk, and going in public. But uh, I, I think um, there's a lot of potential for uh, integrating those technologies with real life outside of the home. Um, to bring it back to that um, augmented reality, like GPS uh, idea, um, I've been thinking it, it would be really neat if people had the ability to uh, leave 3D drawings at a GPS coordinate for someone else to come across and uh, uh, add to or, uh, you know, remix in some way. Um, I, I think uh, the possibilities uh, for pure augmented reality in that space are a little bit less than mixed augmented reality. What I mean is, People are going to be walking around with their headsets, like looking for VR or AR creations uh, wherever they are. But if we had an application that like alerted people when they were close to something that's interesting to look at, then they could pop their um, headset out and look at it briefly and maybe interact with it. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a lot of ways to, to play around with the sort of discoverability mechanics without being socially intrusive and right. and like there's just a lot of room for exploration there and so I feel like it's you know people shouldn't sort of it, I mean some some initial resistance social resistance is to be expected right um, but I, I feel like it'll be it'll be interesting to see how it pans out and who sort of the major players are in the next like three to five years uh, in terms of like how do you communicate uh, to an audience and, and, and elicit mass adoption um, when it's just so radically different than um, right. what we're used to, and yeah. I, but I, I do think that the geo, like the the discoverability and sort of because uh, I mean you know everywhere you go you see signs of people sort of leaving their mark in places and they there's a you know human beings in general have this um, you know innate desire to leave a permanent mark you know mm. in a world that is you know constantly you know we're you know we're ephemeral and all right. these things and so there's how do you sort of leave a, a permanent but non-intrusive mark that you were there and I had this opinion and I felt this way? I, that's a really interesting, I haven't really thought about it like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's why a lot of people hate graffiti and hate graffiti artists. It's because it's inherently intrusive to modify the space that you're in. If you wanna add a little character or you know, put art somewhere, you, the fact of the matter is you have to go over something else that someone else has put up or, you know, destroy something someone's paid money for. So 
it makes it this act of vandalism uh, instead of just pure uh, artistic creation. And I think uh, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality can uh, sort of take that, that destructive part out of it and still let people be, be free in that space. Yeah, it's almost like a layering, and instead of just erasing it, you're sort of adding another layer to it, and kind of, I, I'm, this is very good stuff. We have another um, question from the audience. What is the general technique, this is from Zach, um, sure. what is the general technique for creating the mesh when drawing? Is it something like a tube shape that follows the line in the direction of your, of your finger movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's basically uh, cross sections um, that it adds every frame. So um, I don't know if this version actually has shape anymore. Yeah, I've replaced the shape uh, menu with material, uh, sort of hinting <laughs> what I'm going to do with the next release. But um, in the current version, people can choose between uh, drawing triangles uh, to drawing with squares or up to like septagons. And it seems like people don't use them that much. Um, but Basically, that allows you to change the shape of the cross section that you output as you're drawing. Gotcha. So, Wait, yeah. it's so because Zach is saying it seems like the shape might vary based on your speed or direction. Is that the case, or is it is that just sort of how it's maybe the perception? Uh, well, it, it varies based on the uh, distance from my thumb to my index finger knuckle. So when it's all the way down like this, then you get the full brush width. But if I slowly move my thumb away, it starts to decrease width until it drops off entirely. You're getting, it's a little bit laggy, I think. Okay, I'll just clear it. Yeah. Yeah, we need to figure out um, a way to run all these complicated Oculus demos in some way. Um, yeah, it seems like Skype really gets in the way. Yeah, we, we got to get you guys, get you guys uh, in-house. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, we are, don't have that much time left, um, so I guess um, is there you know what what did you what else did you um, want to go over today while we still have time? Um, let's see, did I cover all of? Oh, actually, I had so many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just quickly go through the the next steps that I had listed here. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, so I want to in integrate new materials, uh, give people the ability to draw with metal, plastic, glass, wood, stone, um, those realistic materials that uh, we work with and see on a daily basis uh, would be really cool to take into this space. But also unrealistic materials, things that are just completely imp impossible in real life, like um, uh, vectors that... Uh, uh, shoot off from your finger uh, into infinity uh, when you're drawing or uh, you know little animated things that come off of uh, the vertices that you deposit or um, uh, impossible materials. I heard this uh, really cool idea um, on the Reddit forums a few months ago when I was playing with impossible colors which is a different color for each eye. Uh, that you can get some really neat effects by showing different materials in each eye, but just slightly uh, modifying the properties of, of the material that you show. So it's not two completely different materials, it's just uh, one that shows like a different uh, bump mapping in the right eye than the left eye, or uh, you know, different normal uh, vectors or something like that. Uh, that's so super that, interesting. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, Aside from that, oh, I think there are some really neat uh, live performance applications for this that I've just begun to scratch the surface on. Uh, I realized um, sort of uh, accidentally as I was playing with an early version of this application that it's really fun to listen to music and uh, draw to the music, uh, especially when you have a shader that pulses uh, over time. Um, especially something that pulses close to the BPM of the music. Uh, so I'm going to experiment a little bit with music visualization and nice. um, yeah, seeing how uh, we can um, uh, make this more satisfying to use like while you're dancing and um, just interested in 
listening to music and seeing cool visuals. Also, uh, VJs, like, uh, what's that actually stand for? Uh, video jockeys. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> those guys um, use game engines and Blender to produce their meshes. And I think it would be really neat to see someone on stage in virtual reality drawing a complex, beautiful structure to the music, maybe something that's planned out um, to produce the visuals behind the performer. Um, yeah, we actually, I spoke, a while back I spoke to a guy, um, God, where, where is he? He's somewhere in Eastern Europe, I believe, but he used, uh, he had two computers and one computer he was controlling essentially the video projections behind him and then the other one was controlling um, various um, aspects of the music that he was playing. Yeah. So it adds this physicality to the uh, performance that, you know, normally it would just be a DJ sort of turning knobs and pressing buttons and it's this like late and passive thing, but then it then it suddenly sort of, you know, springs to life and adds this performative element. And I do think that that is a very um, sort of underexplored aspect of 3D motion control that I'm constantly trying to encourage our developer community to uh, to tap into because it's right. very there's a lot of I mean not only a lot of like creative possibilities there but a lot of I mean there's such a huge market there for all different types of things and um, I don't know I think definitely you're on the right track with that one um, yeah I think that's gonna be a lot of fun to play around yeah. with how much we, more time do we have uh, we have only have uh, four minutes left we did have one other question okay go um, ahead. Will you be able to smooth out the mesh or tweak it anyway after initially painting on the canvas? Yeah, um, so currently meshes come out really chunky. Um, I want things to look smoother in general uh, so users don't have to do that. But I'm also looking at ways that you can modify meshes after you uh, drop them down or you know deposited them in the scene. So one thing I'm looking at is implementing erasing. Uh, turns out to be really computationally expensive to do that uh, because you have to, uh, the, the engine for which mesh is like closest to your finger, which requires iterating over all the meshes and it's, it's icky, but um, I think there are ways to do it. So uh, I'm gonna allow people to um, try to uh, smooth out meshes or maybe amplify the, the noise in the, um, vertices that are deposited, um, and also do things like uh, paint textures on the stuff that they deposit. So there was an image here that has a lot of really cool uh, staining on the concrete. And I feel like you could easily enable someone to create something like this with yeah. a fruit and uh, art application. Um, but uh, I was imagining someone would deposit the concrete and then uh, select like a texture uh, brush and then draw these uh, stains or whatever else they want um, in that spot. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful. That reminds me of that initial thing that you showed us with the, um, the 3D pen a little bit. Oh, right, yeah. It kind of has that element to it. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, I want to, um, we're running out of time here, um, so if anybody has any last minute questions, speak now or forever hold your peace, or you can always, um, you can always, where can we find you on the internet if anybody has any follow up questions? Yeah. Twitter. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, uh, my email, uh, I don't know, I, I should probably just post the text uh, for it because uh, my last name's weird. Um, yeah, I'm I'm on all the social media. Uh, <laughs> if you can't find me through there, uh, my itch.io page. I think right, I'm sharing fun. your Twitter handle for people. Um, I'm yeah. sure that like, yeah, people have any follow up questions. Um, Twitter would be great. Uh, yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts or? Um, I, I'm just so excited about what's happening in the community right now. I'm I'm humbled to be uh, alive and know how to use these technologies uh, uh, while this is happening um, and I, I just think people are going to create amazing things in the future and I'm so excited to see it.
thank you so much for joining us. I agree that it's a really awesome time to be alive. <laughs> I'm stoked. <laughs> um, Thanks okay. for having me. Well, um, yeah, and um, to everybody watching, um, we'll be here every every week at 5 p.m. on Tuesday. So continue to join us. And um, yeah, you can. I run all. I'm Kate, by the way. I don't know if I, I didn't ever uh, introduce myself in the meeting. And I run all social channels and community. And so um, feel free to tweet at me. Um, and with any suggestions about what you'd like to see next, we want to help you build awesome stuff. Um, for virtual reality and um, 3D motion control in general. So um, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Um, and we'll see you next week. And thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay, bye. Bye.